the board of AVRDC for what, almost two years? Is that right? And uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to really focus on an area of production, an area of consumption, and uh, an important source of nutrition. Um, as everyone has said in previous panels, that, that often gets too little attention. Um, I spent almost 30 years working in the U.S. Agency for International Development in agriculture. And many of those years for agriculture investment were pretty bleak. Everyone said, well, you know, I mean, the prices are dropping, world supplies are great, and the reason that people are hungry is that, you know, people are, the distribution is bad. But I think the, the, the challenge of 2008 when prices spiked kind of changed the framework for global production, global consumption, and really drew attention, I think as one of our speakers earlier said, back to nutrition. So I think that the opportunities now for looking at fruits and vegetables, for looking at animal source protein, is really in a place that five years ago, eight years ago, it simply wasn't. So this is a great opportunity, and I think that the, the sort of discussions to this point in this colloquium have really supported the, that sort of positive outlook. But we've been given the title for this conversation on improving future horticulture as an agent of social change and women's empowerment. And I want to draw on the point that Doug made yesterday, that in fact the research <coughs> that's done today, today is going to provide the framework and the, 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 the resources and the materials and the thinking that's going to influence production, consumption, income earning, nutrition 10 years from now. So we really do need to take this forward look and we have an absolutely fantastic panel to kind of address various aspects of that and how horticulture and women's empowerment might, could, should come together over the next 10 to 20 years to really improve the situation. I'd like to frame a little bit this conversation because my own perspective is that populations are becoming more urban and they will become more urban and keeping people down on the farm is probably not such a good mantra. Uh, about the age of seven or eight, my aunt put, put together a vegetable, fruit and vegetable production collective consisting of my sister and three girl cousins. And we produce strawberries early in the season and then we produce <coughs> green beans for the factory the rest of the season. So I, I cover both the fruit and the vegetable side. <laughs> <laughs> and I did that for probably six or seven years. And then when I was grown, I went to work in a green bean factory where we produce canned green beans. Now that will turn you off vegetable consumption forever. <laughs> <laughs> the smell of canned green beans for two months. <laughs> <laughs> I now eat green beans, but I only eat them fresh or frozen. <laughs> I do not eat canned, tin green beans. But I think that the, the population is going to become more urban, and rural youth, such as I was at that point, moving into the urban areas is kind of an inevitable factor of life. And therefore, I think the future of horticulture, what products are grown, how they're marketed, where they fit into diets, is all likely, also likely to change. I think there is going to be much greater and much more intensive peri-urban production of fresh fruits and vegetables for supermarkets and increasingly, even in countries like the United States, organized wet markets and farmers markets. I think there is going to be greater rural production of vegetables and fruits for processing into frozen, canned, and bottled products because I think the issue of seasonality and people wanting to eat strawberries, whatever month of the year it is, is going to persist. I think there is going to be some growth in urban agriculture, although I think I'm not quite as positive as some people are, that urban agriculture and growing huge vegetable pots on your, on your patio in downtown Singapore is really going to be the wave of the future. But I do believe that there is a potential for some growth in urban agriculture. But I, the, the thing that is negative, I think, is that I see potentially a huge loss of diversity in the range of varieties of fruits and vegetables that people consume in the future. And I think Tony sort of gave us the challenge of it doesn't have to be that way. 
But I think the trends right now are very much in the direction of reduced diversity, more toward tomatoes, more toward peppers, more toward cucumbers, less toward some of the indigenous African vegetables, perhaps even less consumption of dried baobab leaves. I think many people are willing to accept this vision of greater peri-urban and urban production combined with more processing and more marketed field-grown fruits and vegetables. But I also think that there's a growing realization that the loss of diversity in, in the varieties of fruits and vegetables currently <coughs> produced, harvested in the wild, consumed, can and must be modified. And I think here's where ICRAP and AVRDC working together really have kind of a new frontier to explore and to, and to advocate. So to address this biodiversity challenge, steps need to be taken to increase consumers' awareness of the health and nutritional value of so-called indigenous fruits and vegetables, including in the places where those indigenous fruits and vegetables are now eaten, consumed, but are seen as kind of poor people's fruit. And I think we also need to develop production and handling methods for these crops so they can profitably enter into value chains that end in urban areas. And I think Tony set us in that direction in a, in a terrific way in the earlier presentation. But I also think and agree that actions need to be taken to encourage farmers in rural areas to continue to grow and harvest from the wild, shea nut trees, the important diversity of vegetables that are still out there. When I walk through an African village, I don't even see half of the food that the people, the women walking with me see. Oh yeah, we can get that, we can harvest that later, we can put this in a soup. I'm looking, it looks like weeds, right? They see it as food. So rural women, of course, do play important roles today in producing, harvesting, and processing vegetables. And they also make the choices, which I think all of us recognize, as to which vegetables families eat, how often, and by their cooking style often, how many nutrients the dishes in which the vegetables are featured actually deliver. Some vegetables that I've eaten in several African countries have been boiled so long, I can't believe there's anything in the way of nutrients <laughs> left in those vegetables. On the other hand, all those parasites or whatever have been destroyed. So, in rural areas of the developing world, Household gardens are often cultivated by women's for their, women for their families' use, and many women, as we've said, do collect wild-grown leafy greens, fruits, and other vegetable crops. But given the outcome and the outlook for greater urbanization, I think it's also important to recognize that women currently and in the future do and will cultivate vegetables for sale. I think people have talked about this recently frequently in this colloquium so far, is that that's the beauty of fruits and vegetables, is that you can eat them and you can sell them. But sometimes these veg women do this on their own, sometimes they do it in groups with other women, sometimes with their husbands or other male family members, and sometimes as workers on larger commercial farms, growing, growing tomatoes, growing onions, growing pineapple, whatever. Women workers have come to dominate employment in packing houses for horticultural products in many countries. And the women that women earn from these horticulture related activities often contribute to their family's welfare. But, and I think this is where we get into the women's empowerment story, this work also enables them to exercise their individual horticultural knowledge and skills in ways that contribute to their own benefit and their own incomes and at the same time to the broader food security and dietary choices available in that, in that area. So I think women's roles in helping to shape the, fruit, the future of fruit and vegetable availability and to ensure that fruits and vegetables continue to improve dietary quality are often overlooked, as we've said many times, by the development agencies such as the one that I was a part of for many years at USAID. <coughs> As vegetable value chains are developed to serve urban, regional, and global markets, men tend to assume greater roles in on-farm production and post-harvest marketing operations take a substantial chunk of the final price paid by the consumer. So if a woman farmer can grow some terrific tomatoes, but by the time those tomatoes actually reach the market in Dar, five other people have taken their share of all the costs in that value chain. 
So as rural populations grow, the practice of growing, harvesting wild-grown fruits and vegetables I think is likely to shrink. Perhaps it can be forestalled. And some of the indigenous vegetables that are now common may disappear from diets. So our conversation today with this terrific panel will consider what initiatives from a number of perspectives, research, development, collaboration, partnerships, might help women in rural and peri-urban areas to use and develop their skills and knowledge regarding vegetable production, processing, marketing, and use in food preparation, <coughs> both to improve their own nutritional and economic situations, as well as to contribute more broadly to health and nutrition of the broader population. So I, whoever chose this panel and sort of said, wouldn't it be great if we had these people on? What a terrific choice. So let me introduce them. Um, Beth Mitchum is sitting here on my right, and she is the post-harvest scientist at the University of California, Davis, which she joined in 1992. And as she said in her introduction to the last question, she is the director of the Hort Horticulture CRISP, <laughs> or Innovation Lab. The CRISP stands for Collaborative Research Support Program, and USAID has supported these, that, that organiz those kinds of organizations since the late 1970s. But about, what, three months ago, five months ago? Um, about six months ago. The current administrator of USAID decided that CRISP was really old-fashioned and that they should now be called Innovation Labs. <laughs> Fortunately, she's also the director of the Post Harvest Techn Technology Center at UC Davis, so she has a great position to be focusing on innovation in horticulture. Sitting next to her is Carmen Tonison, who is a plant scientist by training and did her PhD in field work at a AVRDC and at Erie. She worked with the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation in, and was in charge of SDC country programs in Bhutan, Nepal, Indonesia, Mekong Delta, and Mongolia. And I thought Mongolia was really very interesting because everyone of my friends from USAID who worked there came back and said, oh my god, those people eat way too much boiled, boiled meat. <laughs> so you may, have, you may be able to tell us about vegetables. <laughs> so uh, she also works with the um, Swiss Development Corporation's Global Program for Food Security and is in charge of Swiss investment in agriculture research for development, which of course is this way of linking research to development outcomes. And she chairs the European Initiative for the Ag Research for Agriculture Research for Development, which is better known as ARD. Jackie Ashby is next in line, and she's a development sociologist. You can see we're dealing with kind of a soft side of science here. Previously a director of research in the CGIIR. <laughs> Currently working as a senior advisor for gender research for the CGIIR consortium, headquartered in Montpellier, but you don't live there, correct? Okay. She is also the incoming board chair for a sister center for AVRDC, Katia, in Central America. It's, and Katia is a member of ERCA, and so therefore, one of, we are hoping that Jackie will stay closely associated so with AVRDC through that initiative. Next, we have uh, Robert Holmer, who is, had a P, has a PhD in Ag Sciences from the Technical University in Munich, which he got in 1998. And he directed the peri-urban vegetable project at Xavier University in the Philippines from 1997 to 2009. The Philippines is a great example of a lot of peri-urban and urban agriculture enthusiasts. So I'm hoping you're going to bring that perspective to bear in our discussion. He joined ABRDC in 2010, and he now serves as the regional coordinator for ABRDC in East and Southeast Asia. Last but not least, we have Nagarajin Nukanda, who has a PhD in organizational strategy from the Indian Institute of Technology. He, prior to joining AVRDC, he worked, had a private sector career in industry, working in the health, oil, and chemicals industries. And he has also worked with other international organizations. At AVRDC, he's an HR specialist, but he is also working, he is also an expert in working with nonprofits, both on strategy and in the way that they um, organize and program for performance. And he is the gender focal point for AVRDC, 
So he is going to be the recipient of a lot of the recommendations <laughs> that are going to come from others in this panel. So with that, what I'd like to do is throw out to each of these folks in sequence kind of a couple of questions, which I did cook up and shared with them, so they're not going to be like, why do I have to answer that? <laughs> they know the questions. But I've given them a lot of latitude. Basically said, if you don't like the question, say, well, it's an interesting question, but I'd really rather talk about the question. <laughs> So they're allowed to do that. And what I'll try to do is have each one sort of talk for five or seven minutes about the sort of topic of the question. Then we're going to have a little interchange, and I'm encouraging each of them to kind of listen to what the others say, so that as we formulate things for Nagaraj to take forward in ABRTC, that in fact what we'll, we'll come up with sort of a, a more collective vision here, and then we will definitely involve all of you in the audience to participate in this important final conversation. So Beth, as the director of the Horticulture Innovation Lab, also known as the CRISP, you are leading research of a network of researchers that aim to contribute to the successful evolution of the horticulture sector in the developing world. And you also teach young students, PhD students, at the University of California, Davis, which is a university renowned for its focus on horticultural crops. And I was particularly interested to see from Tony that grapes, which are one of the big specialties of UC Davis, are also one of the, what did you say, the most, the most value adding, the highest value. So Beth is sitting right at the center of this incredible economic engine. So how do you see the future of horticulture evolving? Does, it, does your vision kind of sort of coincide with that which I used to frame this? And what role do you see women playing in both advancing that vision and kind of playing an active role in sort of carrying it out? And one specific question has to do, and it's something we haven't discussed a lot here, how does the emergence of supermarkets and more formal grocery stores as sources of food for urban consumers relate to the kind of innovations and technologies with regard to horticulture that you're working on in the innovation, innovation lab. And what do you think researchers need to focus on if we want to see a future in which a wide variety of safe and interesting and nutritious vegetables are available? So it's kind of a bundle of questions about where are we going? What role are women going to play? How does research and how do women in research play a role in advancing that future? Great. Thank Beth. you. Thank you for that question, uh, or a series of questions. So, so first of all, in terms of the future of horticulture, um, I think horticulture in the future is going to be more consumer oriented. We heard yesterday about you know the need to look at sort of the end user and work it back the other way, and I think we're already starting to see that kind of a shift in in many developed countries in terms of horticulture. Uh, where the needs and the desires of consumers are being uh, considered much more completely. Um, this translates into things like the uh, increase in use of sustainable production practices and also organic farming, um, so uh, providing a safer uh, product. But also there's a demand for more flavorful and more nutritious horticultural products. And, and really those demands are coming from consumers. Uh, so they want something that's going to taste good. If they feed it to their children, they're going to hopefully learn to eat fruits and vegetables more, which is uh, important worldwide to increase consumption for our, for our health. Um, but we're also um, seeing a more of a focus on food safety. So reduced use of pesticides, um, looking to microbial safety. These are things that consumers are concerned about. And certainly the horticultural industry is paying attention to that. I think the same kind of trends are uh, happening, beginning to happen in the developing world, and I see them as trends in the future, in that um, consumers in the developing countries are going to want the same things. They're going to want nutritious food and safe food. I think what we're going to see is a greater adoption of improved production and post-harvest handling practices. I think. Today, there's a lot of improved practices that have not yet been adopted, um, but I think through education and assistance, um, I think we are going to see that those improved practices, including better grading for quality uh, and 
better linkages of growers to markets. I think these things are going to develop in the future. And there are a lot of opportunities for women in horticulture. I mean, women have a lot of horticultural knowledge already. They're heavily engaged in it. Maybe it's through home gardens or through small um, production plots, but they, they hold a lot of that uh, traditional knowledge about production of horticultural crops. I think if we um, help them by providing them with entrepreneurial skills and additional training, I think we can help position them to take um, a key role in horticulture as it develops further in the future. Uh, there may be opportunities in uh, processing industries, maybe in canning of uh, green beans, <laughs> as Emma did. Um, also in uh, some of the uh, grading and sorting, women tend to be particularly good at that kind of detailed work. And we see that worldwide is that they tend to hold those positions. Uh, but I think they can also be entrepreneurs and be the, um, those people in charge of developing these businesses. Certainly there's a lot of interest in reducing losses as well, um, and particularly in the developing world, post-harvest losses are huge. Um, I wanted to relay a quick story related to safety, and it relates to the issue of education of consumers, which I think is something that's going to increase in the future. In Uganda, we were told that tomatoes in the marketplace that had a white powder on them were viewed by consumers as being better because they would last longer, uh, and those consumers didn't realize that those tomatoes had been sprayed with pesticides just prior to harvest, and that was the white powder on the surface. So those sorts of situations, I think, are going to change in the future, uh, but that's going to come um, as we move into the future. In terms of the issue of supermarkets, um, I think supermarkets can have a very positive influence um, there are a lot of potential benefits to be gained when supermarkets uh, develop within a country. First of all, it provides a viable market for growers, and particularly if we can work with the supermarkets to help them to source their products locally. We had a project in Zambia that was doing exactly that. The local supermarkets were buying their produce from South Africa. Um, with the project that we've implemented there, we now have them sourcing almost all their products from Zambia, from the local area. So uh, we need to work with these supermarkets to help encourage them to buy locally, but also to give women entrepreneurs a chance to also participate in that supply chain. A lot of times supermarkets will help with um, technology adoption. They may provide uh, reusable plastic containers for their growers to use to transport the products to the supermarket. That's uh, been used successfully in some places. Sometimes they provide extension services for the growers, so they'll go out and help them with um, improved seed, better practices, kind of filling a gap that sometimes exists in many of these countries. I think it's important to, to work with, uh, again, to work with them on gender sensitivity so that women are included in these opportunities and not excluded. The other benefit of supermarkets is that it provides convenience for women who often have way too many things to do in their lives. If they're able to shop in a supermarket, if it does have a good supply of healthful foods to purchase, they can do their purchasing in a shorter period of time rather than going to many, many different stops. Um, but finally, I think the one concern I would mention in terms of supermarkets I think they can, unfortunately, provide greater access to highly processed foods. And so that, um, that's kind of a negative that sometimes comes along with the introduction of supermarkets. Okay, thanks. So you're basically optimistic. Though. You think that with good management and, and, as you say, gender sensitive kind of programming, in fact, in, women can be involved pretty much along the value chain. Producers, processors, marketers, I think there's and lots consumer. of opportunities if we give them the education and the tools that they need and also try to understand the barriers mm -hmm. and overcome those. Okay, great, good. Thanks very much because I'm sure we'll get back to some of those questions and some of those opportunities and how they can be realized. Carmen Tonison, coming from the donor community right now, Swiss Development Corporation, what opportunities do you see for donor agencies such as SDC or your, your fellow members of AARD 
what do you see as your role in supporting a more vibrant and diverse horticultural sector and ensuring that women are able to participate <coughs> and to take ownership and to benefit from that participation? Because it seems clear that women will continue to work as laborers, both in agriculture and in the post-harvest packing. But what can be done to better empower them to become owners and managers of vegetable-related businesses and to serve as leaders in defining the vegetables of the future? Thank you. I'd like to thank, first of all, the board chair of, uh, of um, AVODC, uh, Dr. Huang as well as uh, Dr. Keating and Dr. Hughes to invite me to this uh, 40th anniversary. And thank you for the questions. Um, yes, as a public donor, we tend to support frame conditions in, uh, to, to um, improve uh, frame conditions for smallholder farmers with access to uh, land, water, input services, markets, value chains. I mean, we have a whole, whole range of doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't speak for the other donors because each of the donors have their own way of seeing or of, um, of, of investing. <coughs> but uh, with SDC, uh, we have two ways, two d different ways. One is a country-focused uh, approach and the other one is a thematic approach. And in a country-focused approach, we would choose based on uh, a certain uh, number of criteria, certain countries with uh, which uh, Switzerland would uh, collaborate. And uh, then um, we would even go within uh, poverty uh, pockets of these countries, um, work on a uh, needs assessment, look at the poverty reduction strategy, and see what other donors and what other, other actors are doing, and see how SDC would then uh, can then support the the the, 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 the situation. Um, definitely, this is a needs assessment. A needs assessment is a basic and a thorough gender analysis is part of this needs assessment. So um, horticulture may come up as one of the opportunities or, or, or one of the fields in which we would uh, invest as there is, a, is a, there is a strong possibility to increase um, income and um, affect uh, li uh, livelihoods positively. On the other side, uh, we have a thematic approach. Um, we have now a global program on food security, which is mainly based on agriculture and, and nutrition. And we support a whole range of, of uh, topics, be it post-harvest and the, 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 the reduction of post-harvest losses, the investment in uh, sustainably, uh, sustainable productivity enhancement on policies, access and availability of food. But um, as related to uh, horticulture, I would say that uh, we are, as, as, as all of us, are more interested in getting to know how does actually uh, agriculture affect nutrition. And so we will follow the path and uh, go towards a nutrition sensitive agriculture and uh, try to better understand how specifically agriculture affects nutrition outcomes. And in a recent paper, uh, that was published on improving nutrition uh, through multi-sectoral approaches, uh, they uh, showed five pathways link of linking agriculture to nutrition. And if we look at these five pathways, um, there is modest ev uh, evidence or variable effects of four of the pathways, whereas the fifth pathway, which is empower women through targeted agricultural in intervention, shows strong evidence. It says over 50% of the reduction in child underweight is attributable to improvement in women's status in agricultural activities, increasing women's discretionary, discretionary income and reducing women's time and labor constraints appear to be especially important to improve nutrition. So I think this underlines also our approach that, um, that, that we want in, to go in the uh, direction of the diversification of diets, as this is also a uh, very strongly focused, uh, a gender-focused um, approach to agriculture. While I go more into details of these uh, approaches, let me share with you that uh, SDC has just celebrated its 10th uh, year's anniversary of our gender policy. And as we're sitting here, I think it's always good when you have a gender policy to share what did we learn from this policy. This policy is about gender equality, gender mainstreaming, and gender differentiated data collection in all our projects. 
Um, what we learned, number one, was that uh, investing intergender is a long process which is worthwhile but requires strong leadership and team effort at all level, levels. It requires facilitation and financial resources and a commitment and, of course, explicit monitoring and evaluation of performance. Secondly, next to mainstreaming, uh, there uh, a focus needs to be also on specific focus group. It, it is good to, to, while you do all the mainstreaming, you also approach different <coughs> focus groups, uh, but this approach has to be need based. Then uh, the th a third uh, lesson would be to, to work with community, with the communities involving men and women and also to work with existing women associations. Uh, this is um, should to be very powerful. And last but not least, to link up market chains from farm to market and, and to, to help all, all along this market chain. So we have decided to move to the di diversification of diets as this is definitely a gender, um, gender targeted, um, is explicitly gender targeting uh, way, um, a gender targeted way of uh, supporting agriculture. And how are we going to go about it? <coughs> I think one of the first points, especially um, now that we have all these countries, I think 35 or 40 countries that, that have signed up uh, in the Sun Movement, uh, this scaling up nutrition. I think uh, not nutrition knowledge and more knowledge about dietary diversity has to be brought up at every level, be it in the schools, uh, but also in uh, television programs, in all kind of media. Second, uh, I think there needs to be a lot of capacity strengthening in bringing the three sectors, agriculture, <coughs> nutrition, and health together. How do we work together? I mean, there's a, this is a whole new field because we speak different languages. And when you d speak different languages, we need to find a common base. But I think there is plenty of opportunities we just have to go for them. Third, when you know that you know uh, vegetables or, or uh, glass of milk, etc., etc., and is good for nutrition, how do you make sure that you have it all year round? And if you don't have it all year round, what can you do to have it all year round? So we go in all this uh, discussion about preservation and post-harvest management of food. And last but not least, I think we need nutrition objectives and indicators in all ag projects, in all projects that we undertake, just as gender uh, indicators, etc. So I think that was what the Great. focus from a donor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmen. I think one of the points we're going to come back to is one of your findings from the multi-sectoral approaches in the fifth pathway of empowering women mm -hmm. for agriculture that reducing women's time and labor constraints is important to improving their nutrition and children's mm -hmm. nutrition. So one of the questions that, that Beth talked about, do in fact, does in fact more organized markets and supermarkets actually reduce women's time and access to food? And is that mm -hmm. part of the, the post-harvest value chain that we mm -hmm. need to look at as well? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate that. So next let's turn to Jackie, Jackie Ashby. Senior Advisor on Gender and Research, big job <laughs> for the CGIAR. What kind of changes do you hope to see in, say, the next five years in the way that international research is conducted, specifically with regard to focusing on outcomes of nutrition and health, but also with regard to gender and the relationship of gender issues to nutrition and health? Um, Obviously, we've spent a lot of time in the CGIR system focusing on greater volumes of staple crops. People have referred to that repeatedly. But focusing on nutrition and health and vegetables and fruit, much more seasonal and much more poorly counted kind of commodities is, is going to be a challenge. And then linking these to the participation of women, bigger challenge yet. So what kind of impacts do you think the changes that are currently being made, it, made by the consortium for example, in CRP4, Ag for Nutrition and Health, they're really going to affect women's participation in agriculture and the benefits they get from that. And could you share any other ideas that you have been gathering on gender and agriculture and indicators and ways to bring <laughs> these together that might be relevant to vegetables, horticulture, women's opportunities and roles, 
and nutrition in health. Well, um, let me start by thanking Dr. Wang and, and Dino for the invitation to speak and uh, for organizing us here and say I'm probably going to answer all that selectively. Okay? <laughs> um, I wanted to start by reminding us why we're so concerned about gender at this point in time. And it, it is particularly because there was a very effective advocacy um, event when the FAO and World Bank published their annual reports that brought together a lot of disparate evidence on what's now commonly referred to as the gender gap in agriculture, showing that uh, in so many dimensions, land, access to labor, access to fertilizer, access to technologies, access to you know, vegetable knowledge, in so many dimensions of agriculture, women have a much lower level of control over or access to or ownership of these kinds of important productive assets. And what that evidence showed, or the analysis showed, was that estimating if you could bring women up to a level of ownership and control over these productive <coughs> assets equal to that of men, you could probably increase the yields on their farms by 30%, and that that would improve overall agricultural output by as much as 4% and could reduce the number of hungry people in the world by as much as 17%. So just by reducing the gender gap, there were important gains to be made that we were missing an opportunity here. And this happened at the time when the CGIR system was undergoing a structural reform. Uh, new programs were being put in place, 15 new research programs, which now I think have an annual budget of around a billion dollars in total. And Part of the structural form and, and writing of these proposals was that gender was not explicitly included. And so there was a big wake-up call at this point. Let's do, we have to do something about the gender gap in agriculture, and we have to change the way that we're doing agricultural research in order to address that. And so the, the CG Consortium started a major effort to mainstream gender into its 15 new research programs. And you see the proof of uh, concept was in Tony's presentation this morning where he presented a slide. I don't know if you remember the slide with the three green circles and a white background, but that talked about the gender mainstreaming in ICRAF's program. And so the, the effort to do gender mainstreaming has, as he showed in that slide, three main components. The first, is to make the gender dimensions of the impact pathways of the different research programs explicit. You know, we've, we've known gender was important for decades. Uh, you go back into the history of the CG and find papers on why it's important to close the gender gap that date back to 1970 something. And they're in the archives, but nothing was done about it. At this point, one of the first things we're doing is to require each of the 15 programs to make the gender dimensions of their impact pathways explicit. And we do that by having each program write a coherent, analytical uh, gender strategy, which explains not just the, the impact pathways, but the theory of change behind them, and lays that out. And fundamental to you know, implementing this, this gender strategy is that we have to improve the collection of sex disaggregated data throughout the system. That has to become a requirement, not just an option. And that um, another, another aspect of this work is to begin to co-locate work that's being done, you know, the rice people, the maize people, the bean people, the, the fruit people, they're all working at different wherever. But from the point of view of doing effective, uh, implementing effective strategic research on gender, we need to co-locate work more <clears throat> so that we can do, for example, long-term panel studies with a, that help us to build the evidence base on how agricultural technology impacts on you know, nutrition and, uh, and family welfare through the empowerment of women. So the, the second 
element of this mainstreaming. The first is to make the gender dimension of impact clear through the gender strategies that each program is writing. The second is to ensure that consideration of gender and the evidence that we're generating from this research implementing the strategies, to ensure consideration of that is integrated into the research cycle of these programs, which means that right from the word go, when priorities are set, when uh, you, know, you decide on the, the plant idiotypes in the breeding program, when you select the target populations in the regions that you're going to work on, when you prioritize the kind of insects or whatever, but when you do that level of research planning, there's also consideration of what the potential impact may be on women and men, the differential impacts on women and men. And this is not, you know, uh, it's not a simple thing to do. Uh, it requires um, more ex-ante impact assessment because, you know, we don't, we have a lot of hypotheses about you know, how vegetables and, and fruit may benefit um, family nutrition through the uh, improving the agency empowerment of women and, and if you said the evidence base is stronger there than in many other in many other pathways but nonetheless the evidence in some cases is very old um, and we know that women's roles in agriculture are changing very dramatically and we don't necessarily have a very good grip on the recent trends. So integrating that evidence into research planning is in itself a major challenge. And that requires institutionalizing a sort of agile learning loop bet between doing strategic, what we call strategic gender research, which is to understand the cause-effect relationships um, in terms of empowerment and family welfare and nutrition development in, in agriculture, uh, and, and learning from that evidence base and then integrating it into the way we make research planning and implementation decisions. And to do that, it's very important, is the third component of the mainstreaming, the overall mainstreaming effort, which is to establish what's called the institutional architecture. And that's all the procedures and policies and practices that an organization like any of the CG centers or AVRDC puts in place to make sure that gender is thoroughly <coughs> integrated into the way it does its research. For example, making sure that you budget resources. Right? It sounds, sounds silly <laughs> in a way, but uh, as Carmen has said, one of the basic lessons we've learned from gender mainstreaming in the past is that if you don't budget resources for it, it's just talk, it just happens on paper. So that's part of the essential uh, institutional architecture. Another is to build responsibilities for making sure that gender research is done, build those responsibilities into people's position descriptions and into their performance assessment. Um, and the other, also mentioned by Carmen, is the importance of committed leadership. So those are the three sort of elements of gender mainstreaming that we've been trying to push forward in the CG system. Now, the point of all this is to try and have an impact on that gender gap, to bring down the inequality between men and women farmers or men and women traders or men and women consumers in the, in the agricultural sector and to, to, to sort of catalyze what to, we see is that cause-effect relationship between increasing the agency of women, improving their control over assets and income, and then seeing uh, that feed forward into improved family welfare in terms of nutrition, improved education for children, and so on and so forth. Um, I just want to, can I wind up? Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I mean, there, are, there. I think there's a much deeper discussion we can have about the types of impacts that we're aiming for, and I think this panel will will, will have that conversation as we go on. I just wanted to mention two aspects in in which, or two aspects of the way that we do research, that probably or almost undoubtedly have to change 
if we're going to succeed in catalyzing this impact power pathway that we, we um, are, you know, that's, that's the sort of whole basis of the argument of why we're doing, why we're mainstreaming gender. And it's as true for fruit and vegetables, I think, as for any of the, of the other CG products, but it's particularly true for fruit and vegetables. Um, and and is that is that we have to do more co-development. Tony referred to this in his talk of uh, getting out of this sort of rather rigid pipeline where we, in the research center, we develop a set of technologies, we come forward with a set of recommendations, then we pass them on to our colleagues in a national program or a development project or an extension system. And then we say, well, I've done my bit. Let's see this, all this good seed be multiplied or whatever it has to go out and let's see the women adopt it and everything will work like clockwork. We know that doesn't happen. To do much more co-development in the sense of bringing our development partners, and I think because of the discussion about the importance of consumers in driving the way horticulture development is going forward, probably co-development is going to have to involve engagement with some of the organized consumer bodies to uh, allow a much more adaptive <coughs> process of, of testing and, and scaling out of the kinds of innovations that we need to see both in production, in marketing, and in the organization, <coughs> particularly the organization of women or, or producer associations to, to sort of drive this development process forward. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can <laughs> yeah. I just ask you a good question? What is an organized consumer body? Well, I'm thinking about the people in fair trade, mm -hmm. right? Ah, because okay. one of the things that you see is um, as in the horticultural industry, in the industrialization of horticulture mm -hmm. in developing countries is that um, there are kind of two development pathways you can see in the literature. One is that uh, women are losing out, essentially. Right? They're losing control over what used mm -hmm. to be traditional crops. They lose control over income. It, you know, it's, it's, the neg it's the downside. And then the upside is that um, they become more empowered. They get more control over income. And there's some indication that, this, uh, that the, the opportunity to become employed in the packing and processing industry you know, opens up that opportunity for women, but it's very important uh, whether ethical standards are applied mm -hmm. in, in the development of that sort of industrialization of the labor force. So we're very attached traditionally to the small farm as the idea that's the engine of development. But when you look at the, uh, the, the empowerment of women, uh, I think there's really a question as to whether the small farm is, is actually a sink of, of gender disempowerment <coughs> and unpaid family labor, and that breaking out of the small farm and becoming an employee, where there are ethical standards, there are studies that show the women themselves think that's, that's really great. You know, they're delighted to be off the small farm. So anyway, that's another conversation. <laughs> yeah, right, that's very provocative. I hope that we can bring to that <laughs> In the, in the conversation after this. Thanks, Jackie. With that, let me turn to Robert Homer. Because Asia is already much more urbanized, effectively, and the sort of opportunities for women outside of the farm and off the farm are obviously much, more, much greater, including in the horticultural sector, through the packing houses, through the managing of markets, through um, food preparation and restaurant operations, and so forth. What changes do you see in vegetable production, processing, marketing, distribution systems in Asia that you think could be shared with your African colleagues, for example, and specifically where Asian women have learned a few lessons, as mm -hmm. Carmen was saying, that they might want to share with, folk, with women in Africa to say, hmm, don't do it like we did, or this is something we did that was really good. So how do, you, how do women that AVRDC is working with in the Southeast Asian region on both home production and food preparation as those involved in more commercial operations see future opportunities for themselves in the horticulture sector. 
challenging question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having worked and lived now for 20 years in Southeast Asia, I'm not really an expert for Africa. But I want to link uh, to Tony's great presentation, and I think he emphasized on the potential of uh, the market. And um, <coughs> if you look, for example, in, in, in Bangkok, um, urban markets are uh, mostly the retailers of the small vegetable markets, or as Dino said, they say also fruits uh, are so they're basically women, and also um, the buyers are women. So from the consumer side, I think um, women uh, know about maybe nutritious uh, diets and uh, look there for their source of food. And we just finished a study in Bangkok and um, we found 161 different kinds of vegetables um, traded and consumed uh, within Bangkok. And um, I'm so happy to, to, to live and work in Bangkok because the variety of, of vegetables just incredible. Of fruits, uh, if we add fruits, we come more than 200. And um, th there are, for example, tops of cashew tree uh, uh, that are eaten, specific flowers. And most of these are not available in the supermarkets, but are available in these small street markets. The same goes for the small um, street food vendors, um, uh, basically also women. And um, I think this is, this is a big opportunity. And I want to link also what Sophia Kaduma mentioned about the young entrepreneurs in Africa that look for the opportunities to engage in horticultural production. I think this is another uh, huge opportunity. However, we have to look at um, the legal situation. Uh, in many countries, it may be difficult for women uh, to buy land, either legally or socially. Um, uh, I think these are issues uh, we have to consider. And um, I want to make an anal uh, analogy with a pig raising project uh, I, I got in contact in the Philippines. So, so, so women got pigs, they raised and sold them. And um, I think if women uh, earn income, they have a much better control about family decisions. Uh, we interviewed some women and they said, okay, this, uh, when my husband wants another baby, I just tell him, okay, who, who would take care of the pig if you have another baby? You know? <laughs> uh, I do not know if you would have the same analogy with, with um, home gardens, which are now, um, uh, I, I would say, uh, really start to flourish. Um, I would like to name an example of uh, Indonesia. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture there um, emphasizes on food diversification because Indonesia is the biggest rice importer in the world. And they saw during the food crisis that they are so dependent on their rice imports. So they try to diversify and they put a lot of emphasis on, on fruits and vegetables. So they um, have now under this program, and luckily we work uh, with this department also in a vegetable goes to school program, um, um, supported uh, more than uh, 6,000 home gardens, which particularly target uh, women. And um, however, there is, uh, I think, one issue um, uh, um, we should consider talking about empowering women. We are in the risk of sometimes maybe over empowering, uh, overloading them with many responsibilities. And um, uh, they have to take care of the family, then they have to tend to the garden, etc. And sometimes the uh, risk um, we should be aware of. And um, also women, we should not treat women isolated. I rather um, would emphasize on a family-based approach. Uh, I think sometimes it's unfair to, to, to uh, fathers or brothers um, among the crowd, uh, a crowd to say it's only women who care about their children. Uh, they're good fathers and good brothers too. Mm -hmm. no? Maybe they're examples the other way around, but they're also bad mothers, maybe, sometimes. No? <laughs> and, 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 and very often women, uh, women do not want to make decisions um, maybe without approval of their husbands. No, uh, mm -hmm. not, not only because they're scared, because uh, anyway, they're married to each other now for, 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 for good reason. <laughs> we all. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, w I want to give an example of uh, a training course. Uh, FAO tasked us this year to, to hold in, 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 in Thailand uh, for uh, extension workers or, uh, from Afghanistan. It was con uh, for one month on vegetable production and nutrition. Originally, FAO wanted only to train women. 
However, there was a lot of commotion and the Afghan partner said, no, we want also men to, to join. And at the start of a training was, was quite a challenge because the men refused to sit together in a van with the women. No? And I said, sorry, we have only one van and it will not go twice and you're now in Thailand. And, uh, that is how it is. And, but, but it worked quite well. No? And um, again, I think our staff, and, and, and luckily yesterday, I'm, I'm so happy that Chila was acknowledged uh, for efforts. Um, she, she did it very well, um, and it worked very well um, in the course of, of, of the program that men and women worked together in the vegetable garden. And at the end of the training, we had a joint cooking session. So we made different teams, and they had to cook nutritious food, which was evaluated by groups. And most of the Afghan men admitted it's the first time we cook, first time we slice vegetables. But they enjoyed it so much. And um, w what I want to emphasize now, um, um, we should try to, to, to look maybe more, more at a family, no? not, not necessarily focus only on women. No? And I think through this approach, empower women. Um, the other question was, um, <coughs> yeah, the future opportunities for women in horticulture. Uh, when I uh, yesterday listened to Chucky's great presentation, there was one point um, you mentioned about grafting and, and the uh, maybe opportunity to go uh, in more automatic processes. Uh, but then I recalled um, about uh, Vietnam, where now about 100 million graftlings per year are produced. Uh, to, to grow grafted tomatoes on more than 5,000 hectares annually, but mostly this is done by women. And um, would they be, uh, lose their jobs? Maybe, maybe this is a question we should also um, think when, when, when we, uh, we go in, in such kind of technology development. And I had a chat yesterday with Jim Fallon um, about agricultural research. And I think your opinion was, does agricultural re research rather uh, impede small farming? Is it rather not, um, uh, uh, is it not rather making, uh, targeting huge enterprises and uh, give more constraints to uh, small farming communities? And I think that is, is uh, I think also an aspect we should look into now when we talk about <coughs> how to design our research program. Do they really uh, target uh, the interests of small farming uh, uh, communities? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robert. You raised, that final point that you raised, I think, is very interesting. And the question is, is vegetable research inherently is, you know, biased toward one scale or another, large scale or small scale? Or is, in fact, vegetable research fairly neutral, scale neutral? That is, it can be used on backyard gardens, homestead gardens, school gardens, as well as large to medium scale enterprises. Or, I don't know, and it's, it's a question as to whether, in fact, vegetable research, because it is so labor intensive, may in fact be one of the more scale neutral approaches to research as opposed to, for example, maize or something. Yeah, interesting, very good, thank you. Um, what I also heard you kind of saying implicitly to, to draw my question with regard to um, opportunities for Africa is you're saying that you know, women in Asia have actually stayed very engaged in both production and marketing of fruits and vegetables, and obviously as consumers. And you, and, and, and the engagement remains empowering, both in terms of income generated as well as the nutritive value of, of the product. I guess one of the questions that we may want to come back to is, is the issue about whether, in fact, there have been any positive sort of interventions which have enabled women to stay in agriculture product, I mean in horticulture production or in horticulture marketing that you found to be particularly helpful and empowering in Asia that we could think about in terms of African intervention. So put that in the back of your mind, we'll come back to it. Good, let me then turn to Nagaraj Inukanda from ABRDC and partly because he asked to wear his HR hat, I want to ask him how important it is for ABRDC and other research institutions to build capacity among scientists to be se sensitive and cognizant of gender issues and to incorporate gender analysis and tools in their work, as Jackie has just said, is part of the CG requirement now. And 
Furthermore, what do you see as necessary skills to really facilitate research understanding of how to include women, get women's participation, and think about facilitating change in that focus group of rural women, urban women, women in markets. So what approach does AVRDC take to accomplish this sort of goal of gender, gender sensitization, not only on women researchers, but across the board? And do you find that partner research institutes are also facing a capacity challenge with regard to both designing and implementing gender sensitive approaches to nutrition? And how do you recommend that ABRDC and your partner institutes really try to address the challenges that Jackie laid out for CG centers more broadly? Not thank you, Amy. Let me thank uh, Dino for giving me this opportunity to be part of this panel. Earlier, any time when I used to talk to people, they used to ask me a question, how difficult it is to recruit women scientists? And this is a, a trend, what do you call it, a conventional question which people used to ask HR person. But it's not so difficult in large part of your job, but in some areas you have difficulty in terms of expertise, in terms of geography, you all work. But the biggest challenge, whether you have men or women scientists, is the capacity part. And it is quite important, having listened to so many of uh, the speakers, emphasizing the empowerment of women as part of the impact uh, continuum. It is uh, it's mandatory for every organization to build capacity. I remember uh, a couple of years back uh, when IFPRI organized uh, the conference of linking agriculture, nutrition, and health. They talked about, in fact, that was one of the key conclusions, which Tim also referred yesterday. Women being central to agriculture, health, and nutrition, because they play all the three roles, it'll be good to focus on women and work with women. And especially these agriculture research institutions have to take that as a sort of a priority in their work. Well said, but many of us, we don't know the how part of the story, mm. how to do that. As Jackie rightly said, CJR centers have been focusing on gender for more than a decade. Decades, yeah. I remember in 2004 when CJR wanted to have a sort of a, a future in their website about gender activities and how our researchers are working on that, they asked the centers to pull out some information. I asked my scientists, can you give me some information what work you do with gender, especially in the areas of gender equality, participation, mainstreaming, gender data, what I got finally was from a couple of scientists a CD of pictures of women they work with. <laughs> the interesting part is many of us, we don't know the entry point, where to enter into gender research. That's the one which we have to look for, and I really like the model what Tony presented and Jackie alluded right now in detail, is a process output impact model which you can incorporate as part of an organizational system. That's more important. Now, coming to capacity, while we recruit, we do ask our scientists questions about gender sensitivity, et cetera, how they are positively uh, inclined to work with women, work with men, work with marginal societies. We do get some good feedback, and they come with some good ideas. But after we recruit, we have to do something different. I think the most important thing uh, uh, of people to have a sort of a base to work is the, the strategy, the system, and processes the organization have in place, and which talk about gender. For example, we, me and Jackie, we were recently reviewing our strategy document and MTP document to find how clearly we are articulating uh, the principles of gender and what we want as gender goals, and we found they are not really there. So we are trying to revise those documents in line with what we want to do. The second part is we have around eight or nine core skills which we want to every scientist to have them as part of their uh, job. Uh, it includes project management skills, M&D skills, how to communicate science effectively, 
data analytics, but gender is not there. But now we are looking at as one of the key components out of the eight skills that could be one of the skills which will be part of the uh, uh, competency set. Now, it's very easy to say again in a framework, in our articulation, but something has to happen in action. Good, the CRPs are pushing us now. We are into two CRPs. In both the CRPs, gender strategy, as Jackie right, and she is driving that, I know about it. The gender strategy is clearly articulated, but there are gaps, but still we have to. That has helped us to look at gender training as an important first step to move forward. In fact, we are organizing a gender uh, training, which is a full one-week program in November with the help of Dr. Barun, who had worked with you. And this workshop will really focus on the concepts of gender, gender analysis, participatory methods, and how to integrate that into our project. In fact, we have a one-day field work also where we are getting into the field and talking to the farmers and incorporating uh, the feedback into our research work. We hope that's going to help many of our scientists to have an entry point into their projects. Okay, skills are enough. Articulation, communicating with the scientists, what we have to do is okay. But the next step is how to integrate them into the performance planning process. That's very important. <coughs> Anything which is not linked to the performance doesn't happen. If you have an MTP, if MTP stands alone and not in, in, as part of your performance goal setting, MTP is an MTP paper. That's all, nothing beyond that. So the best way is to link performance to the goals, what you said. And more specifically, we may have to encourage scientists and also mention that 20% of your score or 10% of your score goes to gender-related goals. I mean, that will help us to move forward. Having put the performance system in place, pushing, motivating scientists to set goals and asking them to perform, you have to recognize extraordinary gender-related performances among them. So rewarding them also makes a lot of sense. So we have a whole a sort of a value chain approach starting from communicating to scientists what we want, and setting the skills in place, training the staff, and also helping them to achieve their goals, recognizing them. So with a $15 million budget and uh, 300 staff and 40 odd scientists, it's very difficult to address empowerment, empowerment of women in all the areas where we work. So it's a big challenge. So there is a need for us to work, and the partners play a critical role. In fact, they have more local knowledge than we in terms of working on gender. They know the local social processes. In fact, social action, I don't think so we can train all our scientists how they can move social action. The social action comes from the partner staff, and there comes how we network. It's, you know, network in partnership is not just uh, uh, signing an MOU and asking them to be part of that. As Carmen rightly pointed out, allocation of resources is very important. Mm -hmm. You have to allocate money. And also help the NGOs or the partners who work with you to adjust their competencies in line with what you don't have. If you look at it, sometimes many of our partners duplicate resources. Mm -hmm. For example, they need not have a high five agriculture scientists, breeders into their uh, <laughs> disciplines. If they are going to do delivery sciences, probably mm -hmm. they can be more focused to the, those areas than looking at duplicating what we have. So it's better we have more sociologists, more anthropologists with the partners mm -hmm. who can do a better job instead of training the scientists again mm -hmm. with them. So in, in that way, you have a, a nice value chain flowing from one end to another and the partners are going to play a key role in implementing and helping us to create an impact on gender uh, women and women. Terrific point, Nagaraj. Thank you. That point about sort of um, using local partnerships as a way of really engaging local communities, people have emphasized families, but also within that, engaging women seems to me an important part of your strategy in terms of building out your capacities. The, the core question here as a small organization.
Can you give us any examples of a particular partner that, that AVRDC has engaged that's been really helpful or useful? Maybe Robert has an example from his, his work as well, where that local partner, and I don't know, I guess we still have, Helen Keller is still here. Have they been helpful in terms of <laughs> doing that? <laughs> Uh, I, I, Victoria, I think uh, they, they are helping us in Arusha. In fact, uh, Svetlana, our staff, she's working with them on some of the projects. In fact, she did share some interviews also with some of the women staff with Helen Krina uh, uh, help. Uh, there are other examples also. I met in uh, West Africa, in uh, Mali. They are also helping us. And we do a lot of uh, nutrition work with uh, that partner. And uh, in India, the SRTT Ratan Tata Foundation, uh, they also help us in empowering women. Some of the uh, good stories we have is uh, from Jharkhand. And uh, currently our engagement in Fiji also is helping us because Fiji is one country where still you have a lot of male domination in agriculture value chain. So we have to do, for example, we have a very interesting opportunity of creating more women entrepreneurs uh, Elizabeth was uh, talking about. Uh, we have a project of uh, participatory guarantee scheme where uh, uh, the farmers are encouraged to form uh, cooperatives and uh, they uh, directly sell their produce to the hotel chain who cater to the tourism industry instead of, uh, it's more a sort of an import substitution. But the problem is it's all male dominated enterprises. We want to include more women in job and, and drop their working on that how to have more women empowerment, training them on management skills, business skills, and help them to negotiate and get a better deal with the hotel chains. Great, good example, excellent. So I think we've really covered a lot of the waterfront here, and it's kind of a no-brainer, uh, how I'm hearing it. It's a no-brainer in terms of concept. As, as Nagaraj just said, agriculture, nutrition, and health, women are at the core of the production, the processing, the the um, family roles that they play in converting food into good nutrition and health for their, for their families and children particularly. Um, but on the other hand, as, as Carmen and, and Jackie pointed out, it isn't so easy actually to make sure that this is happening in real life and that we actually understand the mechanisms that, that are being put in place. Any other questions that you guys would like to pose to each other here and, and based on what you heard or to make a comment in terms of going forward for AVRDC? Yes, comment. Maybe the point that, uh, you know, that Jackie made that, um, you know, we shouldn't only think uh, from research to development in a linear function. It is not linear. And I think it is it is very important to, to bring in the consumer, uh, consumer and development partners before you start research, because otherwise you do research and you hope it, it will end sometime, somewhere in somebody's stomach. Mm -hmm. But it is a long, long way. And nowadays donors are also under pressure to show impact. So if you take this very long way, it would be extremely difficult to show impact. So closing up these gaps, you know, having loops, <coughs> feedback loops, as, mm -hmm. as was also shown by, by, by um, Tim, uh, to Tony. <coughs> I think that that has to be far more interactive. Cannot just start the research and do it in a silo. Maybe you know there, there's a long time research takes until you have a new <laughs> variety. But there are many sorts of research that do not need as much time, and uh, you would gain and learn from partners, you know, while doing it. So I think this action research uh, is that there is a lot of place for for this kind of more action research. And do you think this action research is particularly well suited to the to the challenge of empowering and engaging and empowering yes. women? Because you do it to, to get it with communities, to, right. with with uh, community organizations. I think we can't do it in a silo. We do this research, and then you try to apply something, and then you train. This is too long. I think uh, this was all the, also the discussion we mm. had within the CGIR. Why do we need system programs? Because we cannot just wait uh, for, the, for the new uh, rice variety to somehow impact something. Because next to rice, we have vegetables, we have fruits. The farmer is, is, is and, or the farming community, the farmer family, is more than just waiting for one from different um, inputs to come in, but he combines everything. So it, it has, 
I think um, it, 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 we have to go into another way of thinking that involves more partners, but is, I think, as, as we know, all know, if we have a problem, we go, each one of us, in our room, and we think very, very hard, and we come out with a solution. Mm -hmm. The other way of thinking, uh, of doing this is we brainstorm. We have a brainstorming session, and I think the brainstorming session is going to be much more powerful, and we will advance very much quicker. Can I ask Beth, though, because you mentioned the involvement of consumers and women as consumers. How can that involvement actually inform the upstream part of horticultural research? Well, I think or does it? It, it, it's starting to, I see it in the U.S., and I'm sure it's happening in other parts of the world at the same time, but I think for many, many years, the focus in, in horticulture production has been on yield and disease resistance and uh, appearance quality, and uh, really the, the eating quality, the nutritional value was left behind, and it's really only because consumers are having a renewed interest in their health and their nutrition, but also, you know, the whole food movement. People are interested in how well things taste and they're demanding better uh, eating quality and better nutritional quality. And so now we're seeing that, you know, the seed companies, the breeders are breeding for higher nutrition, they're breeding for uh, better flavor and uh, people, in some cases, are willing to pay a lot more for those varieties. So it's um, and it's trickled down to to more you know mainstream uh, commodities. So I think um, consumers have had a voice, whereas in the past they they didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. You think that how do, how would you recommend that that voice, that consumer voice in Africa, though, for example, be mobilized? You're here. You're talking about sort of right. the foodie groups in the United States <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. UK, yeah. but I think it does. The new happen. restaurants. I think it is there. Um, it is there in Africa. I know. Um, I've heard in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, I mean, the, maybe it's more the um, urban population, but there's a there's an interest in nutrition and nutritious foods. And in fact, the whole African indigenous vegetable movement has become very popular because people recognize that this is a more nutritious product, and um, so they're wanting to eat these products, and um, so we're seeing them now in supermarkets uh, being offered to mm -hmm. consumers. And so I think the demand for better nutrition, I don't know if, if the flavor issue has become a big issue. Um, I think maybe the flavor, maybe the flavor's still there in most of the products. Um, they tend to be harvested more mature. Um, but, but in terms of nutrition, I think the demand is starting to be felt, and it is having some effect on what products are in the market. Great. Great. Good. There's, a, there's a, an interesting story I'd like to share with you, which has to do with the indigenous potatoes in Peru, which in this case I'm going to treat them as a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, a process started of working with farmer groups and farmer associations, and they decided that one of the things they really wanted to do was to rescue their local biodiversity in terms of potatoes. And these are potatoes that are shaped like, you know, little mm. eggplants. They're purple, they're spirals, they're bright pink, they're yellow, they're spotted in purple. They look nothing like the Irish potato. And uh, there was a process of, sort of rescuing this diversity through farmer associations and, and seed banks and what have you. And having done that, they said, okay, now we've, we've got these in our back gardens again, thank goodness and we haven't completely lost them, what are we going to do with them? And they started taking them to local restaurants. And this process built through the farmer associations with the um, International Potato Center became involved in it and the national program. And they engaged with the National Association of Chefs. Mm -hmm. And they managed to convert these weirdo potatoes mm -hmm. into a gourmet food and there's been this incredible uh, growth of um, the sort of specialty potatoes have come into the, this growth of a national cookie, cookery culture in Peru that's, that's grown up around the use of these amazingly varied potatoes. So it's a very nice story of how you can bring in a different kind of partner mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. helped to push this particular product into the limelight and you know, create not
not just a consumer desire for it, but also a sense of, you know, national pride mm -hmm. that the, this local biodiversity is now, you know, very cherished. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to jump in with one more point. I mean, while I think that there is this consumer demand that's growing in some places, I think we have a lot of um, work to do in terms of educating consumers about the health benefits of eating fruits and vegetables. Um, I mean, I've, I've been many places where, you know, people are struggling to find enough food to eat, and then there are fruit trees mm. outside dropping fruit on the ground, and no one's gathering it mm. to eat. And um, so some of that is, you know, what you're used to eating and, and whatnot. But also I remember being in Uganda and, you know, they were talking about how the, they had all these tomatoes and they were losing them and, you know, half the year they didn't have any. And so I said, well, have you considered drying tomatoes? Said, we don't eat dried tomatoes. <laughs> you know, so, but, but, you know and, and there are cultural uh, norms and what people are used to. But I think we have a lot of education to do really to con to, to educate people about the importance, first of all, of diet diversification on their health, the health of their children, but the value that fruits and vegetables can bring to that. Let's open up the conversation to the floor. Victoria, and then you. <coughs> That's a, a, a great segue um, into the point I wanted to make, and I just really enjoyed this panel. I thought it was a uh, uh, really uh, broad-ranging and, and very interesting, a lot of different perspectives. The perspective I'd like to um, uh, talk about now, it, I didn't find it was included so much except what Beth just brought up is, in fact, in terms of, of women's own nutritional, uh, malnutrition issues and how important this is in what we're doing with the promotion of horticultural uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the Lancet series uh, has just come out with in June, another uh, set of papers that really puts the spotlight very brightly on women's nutrition in terms of not just the, the malnutrition that women themselves suffer from. The rates of mal uh, anemia, for instance, can be upwards to 70% in some countries. That has a tremendous negative impact on agricultural production because the work productivity goes down. But also that the old adage, you are what you eat, is actually wrong. You are what your mother ate. And if your mother was <laughs> malnourished during pregnancy, the fetus will develop suboptimally. And that baby who was born normally, well, would be born at high risk of being underweight and higher risk of dying, with all our child survival measures, is now surviving, growing into adulthood, and is now most highly predisposed to non-communicable diseases and obesity later in, child, uh, later in adulthood. So in terms of our discussions yesterday and today, I think we also have to include what we do about undernutrition, malnutrition in women, but more so pre-pregnancy. So that takes us back to the adolescent girls. And I think this has come up once or twice in the discussions yesterday and today, but just to add this comment that we really need to recognize the burden of malnutrition that women, females, um, uh, uh, suffer from and also their role in the solution, not just in terms of being agents of change, but even their physical health has been important for uh, alleviating the problem of this uh, epidemic of non-communicable diseases that we have in the future. It is highly complex. It's also a landscape where we're learning new things every day, uh, but it's something that we really need to recognize. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think that was more of a comment than a question, although if folks want to comment on it again, over here, yeah. Thank you, Colonel. I, I learned a lot from you. I, I wrote about five pages of comments for myself, so thank you. <laughs> I, I felt that the discussion was very much about gender and agriculture in, in general, and I missed the specifics about the challenges and opportunities to horticulture. Whenever horticulture was mentioned, it was always very positive, as, a, as if horticulture can close the gender gap more than any other other agriculture. And I, I would like to hear a bit more about the challenges. Uh, is it really so rosy for horticulture? Are there specific challenges for vegetable producers uh, why it might not actually close the gender gap or might even widen the gender gap? Yeah. Jackie, do you want to make a comment? I actually can make one comment to start okay. based on my, in my experience. <coughs> is that one of the reasons that, that women are very associated with horticulture is that horticulture is very intensive production enterprise. And it doesn't take a lot of land. And the gender gap that Jackie 
sort of noted with regard to access to land, means that women can often grow fruits and vegetables, and they cannot grow staple crops. So in fact, women tend to have, have an opportunity, even when it's production for market, they have more opportunities in the horticulture sector than in the staple sector as independent producers. Secondly, women are, in my experience, own, in, and this is from Africa, sorry guys, they own trees, they can own trees, even if they don't own land. And as Tony pointed out this morning, shea nuts, for example, are, are often owned by women. In northern Nigeria, where I work, women own baobab trees. So the entire baobab leaf industry was controlled by women, who never went out of their houses because they were all in Purda. And they had people bringing in the branches from the trees and then they picked them off and dried them. So again, you have this kind of association of a specific kind of agriculture, which was horticultural vegetables, with, with women. So there are, there are lots of examples. In the Philippines, where I lived for a while, women had the responsibility for certain kinds of greens that men just didn't do, or for certain kinds of other product, product, products, which I can't remember now. It's been a long time. So I think that there, there, are, some speci there are some gender specific women roles with regard to um, fruits and vegetables, but particularly vegetables. Uh, I also think that women have, women's roles in marketing, especially marketing vegetables, and this one is, I don't actually understand very well, um, sort of how this evolved and how it's evolving in Asia. But when you go to virtually any Asian market, the vast majority of people selling fruits and vegetables will be women. The same, I don't know, Sophia, if you want to talk, but in Africa it's also true that a lot of the, the sellers of fruits and vegetables are women. Why is that? Because the margins are quite low, because you can buy quite small amounts on a daily basis and sell them. I'm not quite sure exactly what, but this may be, in Jackie's terms, one of the things to better understand sort of the role along the horticulture value chain to look both why it exists whether it's positive or a negative in terms of opportunity. But other comments from you guys on the, on the panel here? I'll, I'll jump in uh, with a couple comments. One of the, one of the risks we have um, is that as horticultural production becomes more profitable, sometimes women are usurped by um, males in the community or within their own families uh, and can be pushed out of the, the market. So that's something to, to watch for. And, um, I think that's why when we when we offer programs for women that it's good to include the family, cl include the community. I think if, if men are educated about the potential value to their family, to their community, by having women engaged in an entrepreneurial activity, um, then maybe they'll be less likely to uh, usurp them completely from that activity. But I, I, um, I often think about a story we, these uh, women, that we taught to be farmers in Zambia, uh, and they were selling their products to the local hotels and supermarkets. And when we visited with them, we asked them if they had invited the men from their communities to be part of the program. And they had got this big smile on their faces, and uh, they said, well, they wanted to be part of it, but all they wanted to do was hold the money, so we told them not such a gender specific. <laughs> Great. Other questions? Other comments? Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I think I, I learned a lot and listened to many of your comments. And I uh, start to wonder that I think uh, we should be gender sensitive. I think that for scientists, what I learned today is yes, when, I want, when we want to develop certain technology, we need to be gender sensitive. I mean, who are these technology for? But uh, we also understand that if we want to create impact in any society, we have to also culture sensitive. And then you talk about, I mean, Robert talked about that. I mean, for the training course, in the training course, the African men I mean, do the cooking for their very first time in their lifetime. And then how long it's going to take for the African woman to increase their status in their society, I think, we cannot wait, donor cannot wait. I think as societies, I wouldn't want to wait. So I think, so it's probably working as a team 
I think that I remember an NGO in India, Pradhan, they share a story with me and how they empower, they don't say they empower the woman, but they help the woman to recognize themselves and be proudly say that they are a farmer themselves. But as a family, they work as a group. But we all know that a certain job is probably men do the job better than women. But certain things that maybe women do better than men. Uh, and another an illustration in Solomon, and I involved in the project there very much. And our survey showed that women involved in vegetable production in the entire value chain uh, from the production, uh, marketing, and then retailing. So what they really need, the man to help, is the transportation, uh -huh. bringing the produce to the market. So I think that I think it depends on the, the kind of technology and which gender you are targeting. Uh, so I would, I would really say that we need to be gender sensitive, and definitely we need to be culture sensitive. Mm -hmm. Great. And address some of these gender gap kind of issues that emerge from the culture sensitivity. Good. We are just about, I'm just going to say that we're out of time. <laughs> so I want to thank our panelists, Beth, Carmen, Jackie, Robert, and Nagaraj, and say that I think this wraps up the conversations for the colloquium. And I will sort of thank everyone here and then turn over the floor to Jackie. So thank you all.